welcome to 30 Days of Hope. I'm so excited that you decided to join us. So grab that coffee, pull up the chair, grab the kids, get the spouse, and really just enjoy this incredible night of another episode of 30 Days of Hope. Now I'm sitting across from a great new friend of mine, Pastor Asha Fuller. Welcome so much to the show. Hi guys, welcome. Thanks for having me, Colleen. Dr. Colleen. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. And you were, so you're in Washington. And you were kind of like the start of the epicenter because you said you're not too far from Seattle. Yeah. What was it like then and what's it like now? At the beginning, it was kind of, um, we were kind of learning as things go on. Um, we kind of, it was, it was kind of like, some of, some of it was business as usual. There was a, there was a rise in racism to mm -hmm. our Asian like neighbors and that you have to understand in Washington. And especially in the Seattle area, that's the biggest minority group. Really? So having a rise in that area is really significant. Yeah. Um, and they don't t tend to have as much racism as like more African-Americans are more like just, they're just not experiencing the same type of racism. Mm -hmm. So for them, it was a very shock, I think, to that community. Um, I know talking to friends that are Chinese American or like their second, first generation, second mm -hmm. generation, they were talking about that. Yeah. Um, now it's getting better but there's still like mm -hmm. on the more conservative side there's protests mm -hmm. they're trying they're getting kind of we've been locked down for a while so okay. they're okay. getting kind of scared about being at home mm -hmm. and they're kind of getting bored and they're more like why can't we go out but then on the more um there's other people that are more like they've started to see people die they're mm -hmm. not maybe not immediate family members but friends friends of friends or parents, their associates, parents, and other people die. Yeah. So they have yeah. that other thing like, oh no, it's not safe. And there's more of a fear, fear, not a fear, but um a cautious and understanding that this um this disease it could take, could have really mm -hmm. affect you. Even because you're seeing people that are young, like in their 40s and 30s, late 30s, having difficulty being on ventilators and some of them yeah. passing away and they were basically your friends and your colleagues and you're like this is not yeah. something that is that's it, to be um it caution is to be had you know mm. I think and it's so different than we're told because to me it's like when they first kind of got the information it was like you know worry about people that are 65 and older um mm -hmm. it had very strong boundaries but now as you were talking about you know people in their 40s 30s 20s there it, it doesn't this as they've said this virus does not discriminate and it really it does have a face it does have a name and so what does that look like what what has it been especially you know you talked a lot about the discrimination in the beginning has that subsided? Has it gotten worse? I think talking to some of the friends, I think it's gotten, um, it has subsided. Okay. But there is, there has been a recent wave that has begun again, because um, like in our Chinatown, like we went to, um, when it, first when it began, we went into, into the Seattle, the international district, okay. which they have like, um, they have certain areas, like they have Chinatown and they have little Saigon, they have little um, areas like for the Thai. So there's different like communities in that chi international district. So it's it's lots of Asian, but just dif different Asian communities. And um, it was dead. It was just, this is like things that you have people that are waiting around the, waiting around the corner to get to certain shops and they were dead. It was even before the lockdown and um, now they haven't been they haven't they haven't rebounded they're yeah. still is still very dead i know some friends that live in the city they were saying how it was just like it's really dead in that area of town there's um some fear i think some uh, irrational fear some racism mm -hmm. you're reading like i was watching on there was something on the news they were talking about some rate rise of some people putting some like racial symbols on some of the yeah. um on some of the buildings and people were kind of t coming back, the Seattle's were coming back and saying, this isn't appropriate, this isn't who we are and really fighting that. But I know a good friend who owns a tea company, she was saying how um, it was just, 
very because I mean she has she's second generation so she has family still in Taiwan and in China and she was saying how her family's like why aren't you guys wearing masks Mm -hmm. from the beginning and she so she started to wear she was so fearful of wearing a mask because she said the discrimination she might face and she it would it might not be safe for her and she was telling some other people and they're like oh that's not it that I can't believe that you would be have racism and most of the people were white and they're like mm-hmm. and she was saying that and they weren't understanding I said I agree with you friend I can understand what you're saying because yeah. you know some things and even in as a black person you can't just do so it's not safe and yeah. you know that that's the fear of safety versus my health mm. and I think that's mm-hmm. another thing we're not really talking about is how do we use safe safety versus our health and that's what some of the communities are going through how do I be safe but also is someone going to hurt me because I have a mask on just when I'm trying to be safe for my health yeah yeah it's, it's, it's true and I think I like the fact that you touched on that too because I think there is there's a lot of white privilege within right now and I think you know I mean I've you you've seen my social media you've seen kind of like different conversations and it's not so much I call it ignorance leading to arrogance and to me there's nothing wrong with ignorance but allow yourself to be teachable if you're teachable and you want to actually be aware and to connect and to be you know open to what's really happening but if you don't it has this idea of, of white privilege and I see that very emphatically Um, happening right now especially within the protest and there's this idea of of demanding rights demanding emphatically um, and it's it's frustrating to see a confederate flag an anti-semitic flag and a nazi symbol connected with these with these protests what have you seen any of that in washington or or what has it been been like for for you within within this time um we haven't seen any of those kind of like the protests, I don't think we, I haven't seen any of them personally. Um, the, like the symbolism, I think it's more, we see it more online. Um, I haven't saw, I know, I think they were protesting at our Capitol about letting people off, but I didn't see anything. I didn't see any pictures. I wasn't, I didn't go to anything like that. I'm just kind of like, uh, no. <laughs> but, um, and, and none of my friends, they were, they kind of, some of them, I didn't, they, the ones that were more vocal didn't participate. They were mm-hmm. more on the other side. Um, I have friends from, basically, I kind of live in a world where I'm in, I have friends for both sides. I have very conservative, great friends, mm-hmm. and then I have friends that are very more liberal. So I kind of sit in a weird position, you know, with, and both worlds, listening to both worlds talk. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that is helpful too. Where it's almost like I have seen a lot of it online, but I will admit, by God's grace, I haven't seen my friends list participating. And I'm like, okay, thank God. There's, <laughs> and I think it does give you some hope because it's like, all right, well, if this is the minority, I thank God that it's the minority. You know, it does look yeah. big, but at least within my context, it's not it's not becoming the majority voice, um, which I'm thankful for. What, what has it been like? Cause I know you said that you're an associate pastor and, and you really handle a lot. So where it's almost like wherever you're needed, you serve, you kind of wear all these different hats. What has it been like for you to transfer from face to face to mostly online? It's, it's been difficult. It's mm-hmm. for us, I think it's like a learning curve and yeah. a huge learning curve at a point where we're just like, I, I I know how to pastor. I know how to pastor online. And I, I think all of our training has been a good, good pastoring. It's like face to face, let's talk to you. Some, we did some social media for me. I did like some like texting because I, I've worked with younger families. So we know like when you connect with people who are younger, we're going to do texting and some little light emails, but it's now it's so online. It's just, it was a learning, such a learning curve. We had to take tons of classes and it's humbling I think it's a great opportunity for the church because we're letting the younger people kind of lead now like our 20 somethings are kind of more asking them hey how do we do this like my pastor's in his seven almost hitting 70 I think and he is like the the young person on a worship team is telling him okay this is how we do 
Facebook Live. And he's like, okay, let's try it. And then we're like, I'm telling, we're giving each other feedback. We're like, wait, maybe do this and maybe do that. So he's learning. I can see him growing. And I think the team is growing. And I, we have to kind of look at it as I, positively. I think our team is thinking of it as a positive. Mm-hmm. Like, how can we um, really just access and use um, the online tools? Because we're a super small church. We're not like maybe 70 people on a mm-hmm. Sunday. So um, it's really, and then the board is kind of, they're old they're they're like in their they're they're mostly baby boomers you know great people and they're really I appreciate that because they're just like okay we don't really understand this but we're going to try and let's try so they're really people that are trying to go okay how do we do this better and let's let's whatever we can get and try they're yeah. trying they're trying to connect and working our board secretaries doing an excellent job of connecting with people and trying to get re- people resourced and stuff so I think as a team we're kind of like trying to whatever somebody knows we're trying to teach each other and trying to like become still do really good I know my my mom's an elder so my mom's like in her 70s mm-hmm. early 70s mm-hmm. now and um they're calling her a lot of the t- the church is still doing calling for the seniors yeah, and she's more of a she's more of a senior that doesn't like tech so they're calling her making sure she has access to whatever she needs and she because she is african-american and she has like two of the high risk like Mm -hmm. things so i know i told a lot of the team i'm not doing certain things with the younger people because i have to make sure like i still can visit my mom and Mm -hmm. do that things you know just so you know she doesn't have a higher risk even though she kind of doesn't care but she's (laughs) living her life (laughs) you know but (laughs) But, you know, there's, um, I know, I think as a church, we're doing, we're trying to still do, um, access those, let our seniors still have a population of our seniors still, like, be able to be involved, but still use technology and also use the old school calling and people are calling people. So it's um, using small groups more and empowering them to call on people more. So. Yeah, which is really great because I think, you know, you look at, you look at a lot of the churches that are happening and, and it's wonderful because, but a lot of the teaching is directed toward how do you attract millennials and Generation Z, which is wonderful. But now we've almost switched to the fact of how do we make sure that our elders, you know, those that have been in the church that were really kind of standing on their shoulders, they still feel involved. They still feel part of the body and that they don't feel replaced during this time period. Yeah. And I think technology can create such such a barrier to different ages that either have never learned it or don't connect with it. And I love the fact that you really are trying to figure out how do we do this intergenerationally so that every single person feels involved. Yeah, they're doing that really, that's one thing I do know, that they're doing a really good job at making sure it's intergenerational and connecting with people and making sure people still feel connected. Because we have some great, like, saints, they're just not... Yeah tech is just not their thing and they were kind of because I, I do like weekly like devotionals and then some people started talking about it like oh I really love the devotional and then, then they're like they text me I don't have your devotional <laughs> you send it. I'm like oh how do we send that because I didn't even think you know I just kind of was doing it and they're like how do we send that to and then my mom was even telling me she was I saw but I don't know how to turn up the volume. I just saw your mouth moving, so I'll stop. Uh-huh. And when I come over, I'll, I'll play, play it for me, Shaw. <laughs> it's like, but you can see my face. There's just that comfort of. <laughs> I know, she's like, but she's, I think it was good, but, because, and then some of the people were talking to her about it. She's like, oh, she looked cute. I don't know. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm trying to tell her, okay, this is how you do it on your phone, mom. And she's like, Oh uh, no, just, just, it, what, what, how do you, you're going to have to give me like a, a tutorial. I'm like, okay, just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I love the fact also too, you talked about different classes that you took. Where did you find these classes? Where did you learn the skills to really, you know, enact this? Um, a lot of them were online. I have a, I'm blessed, so yeah. blessed. I have this, um, the person who works with me in my ministry is um, 
a graphic designer. And so she was like, when I first got on this, this like first got assigned, I really wasn't, I was just the beginning of this year, I got assigned this position. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, we really need you to work on the website. And I was like, I don't know how to program. I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> how, how do, and I'm sitting there and the pastor's like, well, just, just make, I know you're the can do kind of person, just make it work. We are hundred percent behind you. And I just, and she gave me this list of, of places that were free. And I took upon myself, I just said, okay, I'm going to take a class on WordPress. And then I took some classes. She sent me some classes that she had, she had gotten connected through and she said, okay, this is another free class. And I took, um, I went to a seminar from text in church as a product. Really? And okay. they had, um, they had an online like seminar and they, that's how I learned a lot. And it was just like, I think it was like when I bought the seminar, it was like maybe it's three days. I think it was like 60 bucks. That was the one that I did spend some money on. I think it's a little bit more now afterwards, but they had tons of like little um, classes for like every day. They had like, it was like about a week and there was like four or five classes a day. So I just, I completely did my continuing ed hours. That was, wow. that's yeah. my continuing ed hours were that. And then I learned um, Facebook groups, like there's a church marketers, um, they have church marketing university. I said, wow. okay, this guy did a really cool presentation from there. I'm like, I really want to understand how to do this. So I just, I sat on that. I just asked to become part of that group and on Facebook. And I just, I have just sat and I read people's comments and they do every week. They have these like little every day or like once a week, they have like little classes, like live Facebook feeds. And you just, I just watch and I just take notes. And then being, knowing I am, what my level of understanding is, I just say to people, I said, we can't do everything. I just know my level. I'm not going to be able to do everything that they say, but if I can do two steps, mm. let's try to do two steps well, and then see how it works out. Then maybe as we grow, we can do step three and four. Cause I mean, maybe there's like six steps to something. And I know I can't get through six of those steps. We're not, we're just so young. We're just such a small church and we're so yeah. new to this if we can do steps one and two we can next time we can do steps three four and we, we've worked like that's what we've kind of been working on just trying to do what we can do and and knowing what we can our um our bandwidth and our capacity at this mm. point we're young and we're, we're not young but we're young to this and um our bandwidth and capacity we can only do maybe one or two things but just do those one or two things really well and then build upon success upon success, you know, like any kind of thing in good ministry or in just in life, you know, you build success and then you do another thing that's successful. So the team feels like they're coming at it, not like, oh, I can't this overwhelming because I, I can give them an overwhelming idea and they'll like, we can't do that. That's not going to work. <laughs> but if they say, okay, we did this before, let's try something else. Mm -hmm. Like for us, for our Easter, we were like, there was a, there was this class on like how to make your Easter, um, how to make it much bigger. So it the, expand the people view. And we're like, oh, we only get about maybe 400 people viewing on a, on a Sunday. Yeah. And we're like, okay, if we do it this way, there was like two steps. And we're like, say, what happens if we just do that? And we just text everybody in the church and ask them to share the page. And one hour after we post the Easter, Thing, what will happen and we ended up getting like I think eight, about 1,800 people wow. yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh yeah. and so we just did two steps and I'm like imagine if we if we can get to know how to do the next three steps and they're like oh yeah that's a good idea so we're like we're just doing small things and trying to do the small victories and see things that um get people involved and still as a team kind of go, hey, these are things that we can do and um, using great resources. I, I really like a lot of the, the um, church marketers resources because when, sometimes when they tell you, they tell you in steps. So you go, okay, I can do step one and two. And I, I mean, he kind of goes like, well, he goes much more in depth and there's steps that people can do much more stuff. 
but I only, I know for myself, and he's not, and it don't, it don't make me feel bad, it doesn't make you feel bad, but I just know myself, even when he says where his stop point is, sometimes he's even above where I could stop, so I just do my step one and two, and I said, okay, we're gonna do one and two, and that's what we can do right now, and next time we'll be able to do step one through four, you know, and then maybe in the end, we'll, eventually we'll be able to do all the steps, but as we learn, We'll just start where we can get and be successful there and just see. And also, you know, you have prayer behind everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the prayer team praying and you encourage each other and just work at it. I guess that's what yeah. I, I try to do, you know? Yeah. And I love the fact that you talked about the idea of sell, like that victory. And I think a lot of us, you know, we're, we're trying to scramble and we're trying to be productive. And, you know, we look at steps one through 55 and we're like, wait a minute, I can only do one and two, I can only do like one through 10. And we feel in a sense defeatist because we can't finish all the steps. But I think it's so much more healthier as you were saying, where it's like, give ourselves that time to celebrate. You know, we made and we, we took control and we did it well and we succeeded in steps one and two. And then we actually benefit our team because we're enabling them to have healthy boundaries, take time for self-care, and not overwhelm them with work, but give them the chance to succeed in their own time. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, a great, great form of, of team leadership. I feel like just, as I said, like throughout this time, I'm like, all right, my wall is going to be covered with all the different leadership tips that I've, I've learned through <laughs> <laughs> these interviews. Uh, but this is a great conversation. But before we get off, I want to ask you a question that we ask every single person on here is how are you personally finding hope? Um, I, I found it through just my relationship with Jesus Christ, really mm -hmm. truthfully. Um, it's been so great. And also for me, I have elders in my family so I've I've talked to a lot of my before we went into lockdown officially into lockdown I went to one of my uncles my mom's my mom's oldest brother and I started talking to him and he just is I'm anything basically he's like we are people that have overcome and this is just something that is just a small thing we we will we will survive, we will overcome. And then I just talked, when I got kind of frustrated, like, cause sometimes you get cabin fever. I just give myself permission to find something funny. And I laugh at myself a lot. <laughs> and then I, I just called one of my friends and she is a riot. And we just laugh, just genuinely laugh at the situation, at ourselves and some of the things that had happened. And we found the humor in, mm. in the craziness, you know, and I think for me is that, you know, kind of not trying to take myself too seriously, and also for me, um, doing spiritual disciplines also helped me a lot, not um, every time we, I, I rest a lot, I, I take and give myself time, like, for once a week, I don't do social media, I don't, I rest mentally and physically and just don't do social media if it gets to a point where you're discouraged by it just cut it off for a day or two and pray and like and just just be present in the moment with your family with your friends walk around your neighborhood look at the water look at something else and just say okay it's not it, the world may say all this stuff is going on around us but this is what is happening locally Mm. And this is the good. I see the good. And my one pastor friend always says, I see the good and I pass it on, you know, and kind of doing that. That's kind of when he always talks about that. I go, yeah. And then I also do like, I have a devotional, like what one kind thing can I do today? So I focus on, okay, what kind, one kind thing can I do today? And that makes you so you focus on how can I help somebody? How can I not be about myself? Because I can be selfish. Everybody can be selfish. Mm -hmm. So, so, so selfish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have brain us. <laughs> I know, but it's just anyone. We can be yeah. so selfish and we just don't even try to be. And we, we can't. And being kind and being intentionally kind, not just reaction, just like in our nature, but intentionally kind takes effort. And mm -hmm. I kind of think about, okay, how can I be kind today? What can I do that's kind, truly kind and intentionally kind. 
And that helps me a lot because then I'm not focused on the bad things. And sometimes my intentional kindness is not replying to someone's social media post that I feel like is very offensive. <laughs> I just pray for the person and say, Jesus, you know, take the will. I'm going to pray for this person and maybe we can have a conversation. We need to have a conversation offline. And maybe that conversation, mm -hmm. a lot of times those conversations need to be done in, um, one-on-one -on -one over coffee so we they can hear my voice and i can hear their voice and they can really understand the love i have for them and the love and i can understand the love they have for me and so we don't get it misread through social through reading things you know yeah what's one of good pastor friends and i know what seattle church taught me that i'm like oh you're so right coffee sometimes is the best thing when you're having disagreement, just mm -hmm. bringing people together. He's excellent at that. Yeah. And especially right now, I mean, to me, it's like we can have coffee and we can chat and, you know, we still have that connection. And sometimes, as you said, it's just about hearing the person's tone, their inflection, you know, seeing their body language. And when you're actually to connect with the person, you realize that, wait a minute, like they're, they're a face, they're a feeling, they're, they're a family. And when you see their face, you're you're not so much disagreeing with their topic but you're you're looking at the person face to face so it just it, yeah. it gives you that perspective so but yeah. pastor um this has been wonderful i love the conversation okay, and then for all those watching and listening we're gonna have all those great links too because i think especially if you're a startup nonprofit, or maybe you're a full-time entrepreneur for the first time or you're a pastor in a smaller church and you're looking at all these different resources but you don't have the team that you need to feel like you can make it and these resources will really help you with what you have to get to that next level and to just feel like you're connecting and engaging on Online in some way that's also that's connecting with community but it's also self-care for you so until tomorrow night this is your host dr colleen battelder and i encourage you to keep with us and watch tomorrow's episode of 30 days of hope